Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. Right now, the COVID-19 pandemic is having huge effects all over the world. So first and foremost, the Stronger by Science family sincerely hopes that you are safe and healthy and doing well. It's obviously very important to stay informed about what's going on, but right now the COVID-19 news is pretty bleak and it's also everywhere. So what we would like to do is make sure that our podcast is a place where you can kind of get away from COVID-19 and focus on virtually anything else uh, for, for that time. With that in mind, Greg and I want to use this episode to basically give you all the useful information we have to share that might relate to COVID-19 and basically move away from the topic entirely moving forward. So for today's episode, we are going to talk about how different health-related habits can impact your immune system. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about how to structure an at-home workout with little or even no equipment whatsoever. And then after that, we are going to move on to other topics. So we're going to introduce a good news segment where we just share some positive news, which everybody could use right now. And then we do a lot of Q&As this episode. So in the Q&As, we field a whole bunch of questions on topics, including optimal protein intake, lifting with long limbs, eating to support injury prevention, bench press range of motion, fat burners, and more. To play us out, Greg shares some information about how to make risotto, and then I add a couple extra tips to take your risotto to the next level. As always, thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your very permanent host, Eric Trexler, and I am joined by a very temporary guest host named Greg Knuckles. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me. So, um... A long time ago, we talked a little bit about the schedule for the podcast, right? We mentioned we were going to be taking a summer break, and we looked at the calendar, realized that we were coming up on it, and we are just a little bit behind on Q&As. There are a ton of questions. Um, I don't know how many. It would probably give uh, give me anxiety to count it, but there's a lot of questions to get to, and so for today's episode, we are going a little bit off format. Uh swapping out some of the uh the typical segments that we do and answering a lot of your questions from the list so um as you all know what, what's the link for people to send questions it's uh tiny.cc it's tiny.cc slash sbsqa yes so if you want to add your questions to the list that's where you do it but one of the big focal points for today is we do want to knock out a bunch of the questions that are on there um before we do that um so you're getting news everywhere about the coronavirus. It's not good news. Um, and <laughs> so what we want to do is we, we want the podcast to be a place where you can not basically not think about the coronavirus for a couple hours. Um, but there I, are... I mean, whether or not it's good news kind of depends on your general views regarding social Darwinism. We, <laughs> we are mostly of the opinion that it's overall not good news, but uh, we're not going to yuck your yum. Yeah, sure. So (laughs) what we want to do is there are a couple things we wanted to say related to, you know, how the coronavirus affects you, how you might be able to kind of adjust your fitness plans accordingly. But basically, once we get through that, we want to just move the hell on and and not talk about it here. Um, And and so we're going to have a little quick coach's corner about that today. Um, because a lot of people are going through gym closures right now and they're like, okay, how do I still salvage, salvage my, my fitness goals, my fitness plans? So we're going to talk about that and then move on. Um, and moving forward, we don't want to commit too strongly to anything here, but we are thinking that we're probably going to record some like extreme, like way more off topic podcasts compared to normal kind of like short uh, short audio sessions where we just talk about some fitness stuff and some non-fitness stuff, uh, way less structured than our typical uh, podcast with different segments. Um, so we're, we're not sure how many we're going to do. We're not sure how long they're going to do or, or how long they're going to be. Uh, but if you have any questions that are completely off topic that you want us to chat about, feel free to send them to us just wherever, you know, send them on Facebook, uh, Instagram. Do you have a specific place that you want them? I mean, you can submit them just at tiny.cc slash SPSQA. Um, but yeah, I mean, j- just messaging them to us would probably be better. Uh, we recently put out a call on Facebook and Instagram asking for off-topic questions. Like 90% of the questions we got were still, how do I work out with a home gym? <laughs> um, 
So, I mean, like, we're going to get a bunch of those questions. Um, so try to make them as off topic as possible. Uh, anything, it, it, so just like anything you're generally interested about uh, or interested in that is not fitness related, we know you guys have other interests. You absolutely have to have other interests. So assuming you do something other than work and go to the gym uh, or now, you know, go to work and work out in your apartment or home, uh, ask questions about or ask questions or suggest topics related to those sorts of things. Yeah, and, and, and I might as well just be completely transparent about the impetus for some of these other episodes. Basically, I was working the other day in my apartment. I love to listen to spoken word stuff. Um, when I'm working, I usually just turn on some talk radio, listen to the news. And I'm going to be honest, the other day I was like, I cannot stomach the news. It is the last thing I want to hear right now. And I would love for there to be something that's kind of just fun and chill. And I mean, let's be honest, most of us are socially isolated anyway these days. You know, like I hang out with Greg and my girlfriend and Lindsay and that's it. You know, so we we're thinking like, it'd be great if we could record something that was a thing people could listen to, enjoy it not think too hard, not have the weight of the world on their shoulders. And it'd basically be us hanging out and just inviting you along for the ride. So if you would like to hang out with us, uh, we'd love to have you. Ask us some questions, listen along. It should be very laid back and chill. Anything to add? No, that's about it. Uh, we, we want those segments, the theme of them to be good vibes only. Um, so if you're interested in, in good vibes, check out those episodes. Yeah, and we're going to name them differently. I don't know how we're going to name them, but it'll be obvious what they are. Okay, you want to dive into stuff? We got uh, we got a Coach's Corner coming up here. Let's do it. Okay, so um, Coach's Corner, we wanted to talk a little bit about supporting immune function because it's on a lot of people's minds. Um, we're not going to sell you a special supplement or a ridiculously short ebook. We're just going to tell you stuff that actually <laughs> makes sense. Um a little bit about immune function and a little bit about how to adapt your training if you've got a gym closure. And, and mo I mean, a lot of people do, um, you know, I can't tell you how many of my clients in the last 72 hours, you know, gym shut down. So let's start with immune function. And, and you're going to notice we said supporting immune function. We didn't say, you know, supercharging or boosting because there, there's basically a set of habits you can do to reinforce proper immune function. Um, and that's really the best we can do. You know, we, we can try to maintain some decent habits and make sure that we're not shooting ourselves in the foot when it comes to our immune system's function. Um, so we don't want to oversell it, but you know, th th there is quite a body of research indicating a, a variety of things that you, that you can do, uh, to, to keep your immune system, uh, functioning properly. Uh, Greg, you want to start us off there? Yeah. So one of the first things you're, you're going to want to do is to the greatest degree possible, try to make sure you're sleeping well. So that includes both sleeping enough and trying to, to maintain a consistent circadian rhythm, you know, normal sleep-wake cycle. Um, if you're stressed, it can be difficult to fall asleep. You might be more likely to wake up in the middle of the night. Um, that's, you know, that's something that can happen. Uh, if you stress out about that, that then makes sleeping even more challenging. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't freak out about it, but do try to sleep as much as you can. If you're isolated indoors, um, something that can help is still try to get up around the same time in the morning you typically would to try to maintain that consistent circadian rhythm. Uh, if you're doing work from home or just chilling out at home under quarantine, try to spend a fair amount of the morning near, win near windows so you can get you know, morning blue tinted light into your eyes. Um, that helps with, with regulating your circadian rhythm. Um, and then just all of, all of the other various things we've recommended before on the podcast to help with sleep. So try to, you know, wake up and go to bed at a consistent time. Try to make sure that your bedroom is cool, but not cold. Um, have a consistent bedtime routine that helps you wind down. All of those things will help you sleep better. Um, and, you know, it's not like it's not like you can sleep 14 hours a day and that's going to make your immune system impervious to everything. But not sleeping enough can uh, certainly hinder immune function. Definitely. And, you know, 
another thing to keep in mind is just stress in general. You know, so you mentioned stress can obviously affect your sleep, but the stress itself uh, in many cases is, is, you know, taken to the extreme, not great for immune function. So that involves uh, both psychological stressors, but also physical stressors. So one of the things that we, we mentioned, I believe we mentioned it last episode, is the fact that when people undergo particularly arduous fitness tasks, like one, one of the common examples is marathon running. Um, it, it's not atypical to hear about people when they're either doing an acute bout of exercise that's really arduous, or if they are really overtraining and chronically kind of overreaching. Well, I, I don't want to use those terms lightly, but if they're in a, in a pretty serious overreaching phase, and and creating quite a recovery deficit it's not atypical to see people uh, acquiring just little illnesses that they otherwise might be able to fight off you know we see a little bit of a suppression uh, of immune function in some of those circumstances so managing your stress and again not just thinking psychological stressors but also physical stressors making sure that whatever training you're doing you're really budgeting in time for recovery and managing your overall training load yeah, for sure. I mean, so we're going to talk about, you know, if you can't make it to the gym, how you can still get in good, effective workouts at home. Um, but for the time being, this is probably not... So one, this isn't time to just take off and not exercise at all. Um, continuing to exercise will, again, help support healthy immune function. Um, so you don't want to just sit on the couch all day. That'll also... It's just no fun. Don't do that. Um, yeah, I mean, your psychological health, like <laughs> that right. ain't going to be good. But, yeah. but at the same time, don't think, oh, I'm not working right now. Like they're telling me I can't go into work. So I'm just going to train like a madman in my apartment and do like push ups and body weight squats for six hours a day. That's also probably not the best thing to do. So th the name of the game is, you know, you, you want to still be training hard enough that you're accomplishing something. Um, but maintenance or slight gains are kind of the name of the game right now. Um, you, you don't want to just crank your workouts up to 11. This is not the time for that. Right. And, and then one other thing to talk about is the nutrition side. So, um, you know, there's, God, there's a lot of people pushing supplements right now, which is really gross. Um, just with, you know, the really ridiculous claims that are like super specific to coronavirus. It's like, come on, dude. It, there's not even a chance that there's science to support that. <laughs> there is no science. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, but, um, but you know, general good nutrition habits, making sure that you don't have any glaring, uh, you know, vitamin or mineral deficiencies, making sure you've got all your bases covered when it comes to your overall nutrient intake. And another thing is making sure you have at least reasonably adequate caloric intake. Um, and we were talking earlier, you mentioned, you know, weight loss, for obese people, probably fine to continue, you know, with those weight loss goals. Um, you know, but if you're already pretty lean, probably not the best time to go into like a super huge deficit and try to get like absolutely shredded. Um, that, that's what you are mentioning earlier. Yeah. Um, so just to give credit where it's due, uh, Saul Orwell was the person who, who put this on my radar. Um, he said we should write an article about this. I don't know that there's enough research to kind of warrant a full article. Um, but he sent me some stuff that he said would be worth addressing to just get the information out there. Um, if, you are, if you are quite overweight, being in a moderate calorie deficit doesn't really seem to have any meaningful impact on immune function. Um, but weight loss and especially pretty aggressive caloric deficits if you're already normal weight or like fairly lean already, um, can hinder immune function to some degree. So, you know, if, if you're if you're on a cut right now and you're a little fluffy, you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you're already kind of lean and you're just kind of very gradually trying to lean out, that's probably okay too. Um, but don't think, hey, you know, I don't have that many obligations on a day-to-day -day basis anymore now is the time to cut my calories to 1200 and do a protein sparing modified fast. That is, that is probably not recommended uh, if you're trying to support healthy immune function. Yeah. And I'll say anecdotally, um, cause you know, my background, I, I started as a wrestler and then I became a natural bodybuilder. Uh, wrestling, it was something you always kept an eye out. You know, the, the kids that were cutting weight super hard, they just always seemed to get whatever bug was going around. 
uh, with bodybuilding, again, when you're going from lean to just shredded and eating just stupidly low calories, it's something that you have to keep on your radar. It is, you know, just the little colds and flus that go around. So um, generally speaking, not... <laughs> I know this is going to be a tough pill to swallow, but your body doesn't want to be 5% body fat and barely eating. <laughs> um, and believe it or not, that can have effects on your immune system. So, um, you know, what we just what we just laid out there, um, not a compelling ebook. Um, don't know what kind of powder we could turn that into for a profit. Um, I got to be honest, I'm really grossed out by a lot of the stuff I see right now with people just like capitalizing on this fear. But we're going to leave it at that. Are we, though? I, I think we so, are. So he, here's what I'm going to say. Here's all I want to say. We can edit this out if it goes too far. Um, <laughs> Just don't mention anybody by name. I'm not going to. Okay. So the, the stuff the stuff with supplements, I agree with your assessment. That is just completely gross. Um and even like stuff that has been potentially shown to have some applications in in some circumstances, we can't know if any of that applies to coronavirus. So like, for example, there's some research showing that if you take a garlic supplement or you have high levels of garlic intake, that slightly reduces your risk of catching a common cold. But like, dude, one, it's a it's a completely different category of virus. Um, I was going to give a list. It's, it's yeah. one thing we yeah. have no fucking idea if that applies to coronavirus and that, and that applies to anything that anyone is shilling right now. Um, so like the supplement stuff is gross. And then like, dude, like you said, we have seen a few people trying to sell how to not get coronavirus eBooks. So one, if you're not working in a medical profession, like if you're not an infectious disease expert, you don't fucking know. And also, this shit blew up, what, maybe a month? Maybe two months ago, if you were someone really following the news out of China. You haven't done sufficient reading to be able to put a product like that together, even if there is potentially relevant research out there, one. And then two, like, dude, you fucking threw this shit together in two months. <sighs> no matter what you're trying to sell, one, it's gross that you're trying to sell it. If you think it's that important... Just give it out to people. Like, this isn't the time to, to profit maximize. And two, it's going to suck. Like, it's going <laughs> to fucking suck. You haven't had time to put a good product together. Well, uh, so so on, on one hand, it is very ethically slimy. And two, it's going to be a dog shit product. Like, capitalizing on fear is, is bad in the general sense. But then yeah. capitalizing on fear with utter dog shit is even worse. So just like make note of who is doing that and never do business with them again. Yeah. And I, I should clarify, um, I, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, the fact that a person might write something about here are habits to help with your immune system. And maybe they wrote it a year ago and it's like a general thing, or maybe they have some kind of general immune supporting supplement. Um, that that's not inherently bad. Yeah, it's more like the messaging. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The thing that the, the thing that we're really, really catch that really catches our eye the wrong way is when people very specifically link that to coronavirus and are pushing it right now. Like honestly, when the World Health Organization tells me something about coronavirus, my response is, I'm not sure if you guys are totally sure about that because they're they're honest. They're like, a oh, preliminary thing coming out. Maybe it's true. Seems like these are some observations, right? So if the World Health Organization is putting like 95 caveats on everything that comes out, aside from wash your hands, it really makes me wonder exactly how many nuggets are hidden in that special ebook. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. And, and by the way, just to be abundantly clear, I'm not saying to be skeptical of the information coming from, from large national and international health bodies. But I'm reflecting the confidence of their statements. You know, yeah, yeah. You, you've seen their statements when they're like, I don't know, we've been trying this treatment. It seems okay. But like everyone acknowledges there is no peer reviewed science because, I mean, you could put a preprint out there, but there's no, I, I mean, are there any papers that have actually gone through review yet? There have been a couple, but, and, it, but, but it's, it's like it's, expedited. Yeah, and and it's, it's more like 
So, I mean, this very well may be different by the time this episode comes out, but there have been a, a handful of papers that are just generally trying to characterize right, the, yeah. the disease itself. Yeah. Um, and there there are a couple preprints, like you mentioned, about some drug therapies that are showing some degree of promise. Yeah. But it's not like a bot botanical extract. Like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> if, if, we, if we're talking about the stuff that actual medical bodies are showing interest in to treat this thing um yeah it's probably not shit you're going to be able to get your hands on turns out watermelon juice who knew <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's not really how it works yeah um but no i mean it's it, uh, okay i think we've said enough about it right yeah. I, I i so let's move on a little bit and talk about um how to basically make the most of this right so a lot of people going through gym closures um and i think a lot of people, they associate their strength goals, their performance goals, their physique goals with being in a physical brick and mortar gym. Mm -hmm. And I think when you hear that gym access is gone, you're like, okay, well, that's that's a dead end, right? But, yeah. but there's a lot of stuff that you can do at home, right? E even if you don't have a home gym. Correct. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a big, uh, a big caveat there. So Greg, I guess the first question is, so someone's interested in um, basically they don't have a home gym and they're not able to swing it right now, you know, like, mm -hmm. cause that's not really a solution is be like, Oh, can't get to the gym, build one. Like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great for like five people. Yeah. But... Like th that's another thing that has been <laughs> irking me a little bit where folks are just like, Oh, your gym closed. That's fine. Just buy a power rack and barbell and a bunch of iron. And the thing is like, I have that. It's great. It's in my garage. It's awesome. I love it. But in terms of just like putting that out as like a general recommendation to everyone in your Instagram audience, that's, um, I don't know. I don't want to be too judgmental and call it like elitist bourgeois shit. But the thing is like most people don't have an empty garage, don't have an empty room in their house and don't have, I mean, even a cheap rack's going to run you a couple hundred bucks. Even if you get like the cheapest barbell they sell on Amazon, that's probably going to be like a hundred bucks or so a good barbell is going to run you 250 300 um plates even if you're buying them used generally go for about 50 cents a pound give or take and so even if you're just outfitting the most bare bones home gym possible which again if you can afford and you have the space for it i think is awesome but that that is that is a very non-negligible expense um and it's not something that that you should really be able to expect of everyone Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there are, you know, a ton of people who have home gyms. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. It's not like it makes you some like ultra elite billionaire, right. To have a home gym. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It, when, when I hear that advice, just kind of getting pushed out as if it's no big deal. I feel like that's saying like, don't like cooking. Here's a life hack. Hire a chef. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's, I, it's, I can't. It's, more, it's more like when it's, when it's packaged, it's just like a very flippant thing. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, Oh, you don't have a grand that you can spend on the drop of a dime. Ha ha peasant. Like yeah. that's, yeah. Okay. So, so Greg, we're, if if we're not going to build a home gym, what are some of the things that that you can get on like a really a, a really small budget where you could be like, okay, how do we get a couple items that really maximize what we can do at home? Yeah. So first things first, uh, the cheapest thing is free, and uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do absolutely for free. So upper body training and especially like quote unquote push training. So pecs and triceps, um, very easy to, to train those muscles at home. So you can do push-ups. Um, if you have a, a table or a counter, you can stand back from that, put your hands on the edge and like do skull crushers. Um, you can do any number of push-up variations. If push-ups are super easy for you, you can elevate your feet to make them a little bit harder. You can put your hands on books or stools or something to extend the range of motion to make them a little bit harder. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do for pecs and triceps. Very, very simply. Can I, can I add one thing there? Yeah, um, go for it. You mentioned adding books. I've been doing a lot of uneven push-ups in, in recent months where I basically would put like maybe a stack of books under one hand but not the other. Mm -hmm. And I would do these at the gym. I would get, like, I had access to all the machines you'd want. And I'd still be like, nah, give me a stack of stuff. And I'd do these uneven push ups. The stretch you get in the pec oh, yeah. is insane. I mean, I was dying. There was, there was no machine in the gym that was going to give me that. I mean, it was great. Dude, it's sick. It's, it's like the same thing as dumbbells, but like 
you know, your scapula is still pinned when you're doing dumbbells. So it's, it's the same benefit, but you can still have full scapular movement. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like, so I've also seen some hot takes on Instagram, like, oh, like pushups are fine for these plebs, but like, I'm a super elite bencher. Like, <laughs> it's not enough for me. Fuck that. It's not like, <laughs> dude, we're so w- w- with the caveat that training can be high rep enough that it's not necessarily ideal for hypertrophy. So there's, there's some research showing that down to about 30, 40% one RM, as long as you're pushing sets to failure on a per set basis, hypertrophy is going to run its course and be good. Once you get down into like the 20% range, which, you know, is stuff you can probably do for 50, 75 plus reps, then, you know, it's, it's starting to become different from resistance exercise. And so hypertrophy isn't going to be maximized. Um, so like one, you probably aren't doing 70 pushups per set through a good full range of motion, but let's assume you are. Dude, just do like single arm pushups. Those are hard. If if you're knocking out multiple sets of like 30 single arm pushups through a full range of motion, uh you're fucking strong. Like th- that that no matter how good of a bencher you are, I I could almost guarantee that you can't do just routine one arm push-ups for dozens of reps per set. And if you can, then maybe the complaint of oh push-ups aren't enough applies. But otherwise, you can you can get a lot done with push-ups. Uh as far as like upper back training and like quote unquote pull training goes, um here you have to be a little bit more creative. You can do it with with just body weight, but it's not going to be as easy as training pecs and triceps. So if you have decent finger sh- fingertip strength, um, you can do pull-ups on a door frame. Um, that's something that climbers do a lot, which again, you do need pretty decent fingertip strength for, for that. A classic is table rows. So you just get under a table, you grab the lip of a table, you do rows up to that. One thing to be a little bit careful about with table rows is you'll probably want to put a counterweight on the other end of the table just to make sure you don't flip it onto yourself. Um, But just due to how torque works, um, if you put a reasonable amount of weight on the other end of the table, it's going to be stable. It's going to be fine. Um, If you are cooped up in the house with someone else, you can do buddy rows. So, you know, you, you lay between the other person's legs and basically do rows up into their crotch. Uh, if it's a significant other, that's fine. If it's, you know, like a roommate or something, you'll get to know each other better. That's okay. <laughs> um, and then for extremely low cost, if you can get like a gallon jug or I don't know what they sell, what increments they sell jugs in and in places that don't use Imperial, but assuming you have like four or five liter jugs or something like that, Fill it up with water. A gallon of water, I believe, is 8.28 pounds, give or take. Somewhere around 8 pounds. Um, so, you know, it's going to be high reps, but you can do curls with that. Um, if it's liters, then however many liters it is, if you fill it up with water, it's going to be that many kilos. And if there's a store nearby that sells 5-gallon jugs of water, um, that's going to be like 40 pounds, which, you know... There, if you're super, super strong, that may not be enough weight. But for most people listening to this, that's going to be plenty of weight for rows and also uh, like delt raises. Um, So yeah, those would be some recommendations for a very, very small investment in money. If you can get one of those over-the-door pull-up bars, um, that suddenly makes upper back training super, super easy, Um, you know. You can now do pull-ups. <laughs> yeah. um, looks like you're going to say something. Well, I was thinking, don't they have? Don't they also have pull-up bars that you can put like within the door frame instead of over the top? Because I was thinking, if you could set something up like that for rows, that would be pretty nice. I don't trust those. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. The the uh, potential downside is pretty obvious. Uh, you yeah. Fall. <laughs> so so they they operate on the assumption that you can generate enough tension with yeah. like. There's like a twist apart mechanism and it puts tension against either side of the door. Yeah. Um, I have seen too many people fall off of I've those. Seen, <laughs> I've seen a lot of those videos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's a good point. Um, 
So yeah, if you get a if you get a over the door pull up bar, pull ups suddenly become incredibly easy. If you're somewhere where you're still allowed to go outside and you have a tree nearby, you can do pull ups on a tree branch. Um, you know, if it's in public, people may look at you weird, but I mean, whatever, it's fine. Those people don't matter. Um, you can do pull ups on a tree branch. It's perfectly okay. The only thing that is considerably more challenging if you're, you know, just trying to do home workouts and either don't have any equipment or only want to buy very, very minimal equipment is lower body training. So in terms of stuff you can do with just body weight, um, the, the idea that comes to mind for most people immediately is body weight squats. And I will note, if you're squatting down to a full range of motion and only coming back up to what would essentially be your sticking point with a normal barbell squat, those do get pretty hard pretty quick. Um, like, I mean, if if you're in decent kind of like local aerobic shape with your quads and hip extensors, you might be able to bust out a set of 100. But if you just give it a shot and you've never done it before, it's going to start burning pretty bad by probably somewhere between 30 and 50 reps, give or take. Um, so, so you can get some mileage out of that. Um, something like a, a two-leg glute bridge is probably going to be super easy to do for an enormous number of reps, but make it single leg, it suddenly becomes considerably more challenging. You'll be able to train your glutes that way. As far as quad training goes, um, split squats are good. You can do those for a bunch of reps. They're going to be a lot harder than bilateral body weight squats. Um, if you have a place where you can do lunges, even if it's just back and forth across a room, high weight lunge or high rep lunges are absolutely killer. Um, so again, you, you won't be able to load them super heavy with just body weight, obviously, but they can be quite challenging. Then I think the, I think maybe the most slept on body weight, lower body exercise is high step ups. So if you have if you have stuff in your house that is just of various different heights, if you do a step up where like the thing you're stepping up and down off of is say below knee height, it's probably going to be fairly easy. So if you've done step ups before, you probably don't realize just how much assistance you're getting from the down leg um, and just using your calves to push back up off the ground. But if you do uh, if you do step ups and for each rep, all you do is tap your heel to the ground keep your knees straight and don't use your non-working leg to help you at all, even like a pretty low step up can get pretty challenging. Um, so I taught some weight training classes the past couple of years um, when I was in grad school. And th there were some people in, there were some people in the class who were just kind of like nervous of lower body training. So like the leg press machine intimidated them. They didn't want to put the bar on their back and do squats. Uh, maybe they had some experience with like split squats or body weight squats from like fitness classes they'd done before and those were pretty easy. I introduced them to strict step ups and that humbled a lot of people really quick. Um, and you can get good, you, you can get surprisingly effective training with just body weight doing step ups. And so like I said, fairly low step ups can be fairly challenging if you're doing them strict as the height of the thing you're, you're stepping up on or lowering yourself down off of goes up, the challenge increases dramatically. So if you can get to the point that you can do really, really strict step ups where again, you're just tapping your heel to the ground, not getting any assistance from your down leg, where your working leg is going through the same range of motion or a longer range of motion than it would go through on squats, you're pretty strong by that point. Like those are hard. Those are legitimately hard, no matter how strong you are. Uh, and then the other thing you can do with just body weight for lower body training, um, similar to step ups is pistols. So just single leg squats. A lot of people don't have good enough ankle mobility to do legitimate pistols. Um, and if that's the case, that's fine. You can probably still do partials. So basically like box squats, but with pistols, um, where you know, you start on a chair and then if there's something a little bit lower, so maybe your couch is a little bit lower than a chair, then you do it down to a couch. Uh, and if you can't go all the way down, like, you know, maybe you are just doing partials, but pistols are also shockingly difficult for a lot of people. And so there are a few other things on our list that you can do 
if you have access to just a little bit more equipment, but with access to just your body weight um, and like some water jugs, you can train most parts of your body pretty effectively. The only things that are going to be p potentially left out there is there's not anything great there for hamstrings. Although I should note, if there if you have something that you can use to to anchor your feet to the ground, or again if you're cooped up with someone else, a roommate, a romantic partner, whatever, if they're willing to hold your ankles, um, you can do Nordic hamstring curls. If you've never done those before, prepare for a world of pain. They will fucking murder you. Brutal. Um, so again, if, if you have if you have something to secure your ankles, you can train your hamstrings pretty well. Also, so really the only muscle groups that are a little bit more challenging to train with no equipment or very, very minimal equipment uh, is your traps, which if you have those five gallon jugs, you can just do a ton of light shrugs with like 40 pounds and it's gonna get hard after a while, but that really isn't ideal. So traps are a little bit more challenging. Um, and then your spinal erectors, uh, without external loading, it is quite a bit more challenging to train your, your spinal erectors, unfortunately, but most of your body you can train just fine. Also, so I, w I was kind of like going head to toe, um, trying to get everything in my head just now. I forgot, I didn't mention calves. I love calf training. I've talked about this on the podcast before. Calf training is great. If you have a step or just anything you can elevate your foot up on, just body weight strict single leg calf raises can also be absolutely humbling. So go all the way down at the bottom, get a deep stretch. Uh, you want to be holding on to something so you don't lose your balance, but you don't use your upper body to assist you at all. Get a deep stretch and then control it on the way up. You don't want to just use spring from your Achilles tendon. You want to actively contract your calf coming up, then hold that contraction for about a second, control yourself on the way down, deep stretch, control on the way up, squeeze, like, I mean, it, it depends how much you weigh. That's a very body weight dependent thing. Um, but, you know, sets of 30, 40 of those are going to be able to get, to get most people a pretty good calf stimulus as well. Um, so again, traps are challenging. Uh, spinal erectors are challenging. Everything else really, really isn't that hard to train with just body weight or very, very minimal equipment. And if somebody was going to take that next step when it comes to equipment um you know you mentioned like just gallon jugs or multiple gallon jugs if you can find them are good uh you mentioned the pull-up bar bands obviously are, are a good option if you're looking to expand uh, what you can do a little bit um another thing like it, there's the uh the trx or any kind of suspension system like that those can really open up what you can do in, in terms of your exercise selection. And, uh, you know, I have some clients that were like, dude, gym is completely closed. We're screwed. And I was like, okay, well, what do we have sitting in the garage? And they're like, well, some adjustable dumbbells up to 90. And I'm like, dude, we have a gym. <laughs> like <laughs> if, if you, if you could get like a, just a set of adjustable dumbbells, like if, if you're going from 10 to 90, you can get a lot done because I mean, every little tool you add on is just extra. Like you mm -hmm. said, body weight alone can take you very, very far. Um, you know, your cardio plans are totally unencumbered in most cases. Uh, my understanding is, you know, uh, most uh, health organizations aren't necessarily saying you can't go outside in some cases, but don't congregate with other people, mm -hmm. keep distance. Obviously some places are in like total lockdown and that's not the case, but but, but a lot of people, you know, you could still go outside and go for a jog alone or, you know, without a, a group of people. But yeah, adding just a couple little things on a really small budget, you can really open up a lot of exercises. And uh, we, we are going to have, a, by, by the time this podcast airs, we'll probably have an article out, wouldn't you think? I would think so. We, we should be able to get yeah. it done by then. Yeah. So we're, we're working on an article that kind of puts all these ideas together um, when it comes to body weight exercises. So uh if you're listening to this, check out the website. It's probably up there already. And if it is, we, we've certainly shared it on social media. So um, did you have anything else you wanted to add for that segment? Yeah, I, I think there's more to say about bands. Okay, yeah, go for um, it. So <laughs> I, was, uh, I was powerlifting during the peak of the Westside era. 
So I have I have a lot of experience with bands, and I, I think I think current lifters who didn't kind of go through the band craze don't understand just how flexible bands can be. So virtually any exercise that one might do on a machine, one can do with bands. Uh, anything that's reasonably heavy that you can use to anchor bands gives you an angle at which you can do an exercise. So if you have, so I talked about how push-ups can be made very difficult with just body weight. If you don't want to mess around with single arm push-ups or anything like that, um, if you have some reasonably heavy bands, they can supply one, two, three hundred pounds of tension. You can you can do band resisted push ups just like bench press. And like, don't try to flex and say that that's not good enough for me. Like, I bench very close to five hundred pounds. So if I have access to ideally a monster band, but if not a monster, then either two strong bands or a strong band and an average band using like the old school jump stretch bands. That is that is hard enough to train bench press for me. Like it, the movements feel slightly different because it's not like a linear resistance curve. So it is going to be a little bit harder at the top, a little bit easier at the bottom. But it feels pretty comparable to a bench press, and I can I can comfortably get enough band resistance to where sets of five to eight reps of band resisted push ups are hard. Um, so you can make upper body training very very easy. Um, if you're someone who, you know, you're used to doing weighted push-ups, and, you know, you don't have a weight belt and a bunch of plates at home, you can do band-resisted push-ups if, so if you have a belt, like just, just a normal-ass belt, or even like a piece of rope, uh, and something to anchor a band to on the ground, you can attach the band to your belt, uh, and use band resistance for pull-ups, that's going to be very challenging, should be enough for virtually anyone, no matter how good you are at pull-ups, as long as you have enough band tension. Uh, and then, like I said before, probably the most challenging muscles to train without access to external resistance in a gym setup are going to be your spinal erectors. So one of the things you can do if you have access, again, to not just like little thera bands that you might use to rehab a rotator cuff muscle, but like legit lifting bands. Um, dude, you can just do squats and deadlifts. Um, so the easiest thing is, is going to be band resistant squats or like band resistant, band resisted good mornings to train deadlifts. Uh, but you can just get a bunch of band tension. You stand on, on one end of the band. So like you stand within the band and your feet are holding it down and then you squat down, you get the rest of the bands, you put them across your shoulders. So around where you'd put the bar for a low bar squat. Uh, you hold the bands to make sure they stay in place. And then you can just do squats and you can do good mornings. Um, so there are there are cheap bands that you can get off of like Amazon that are that are gonna be quite a bit cheaper. But for for I think like 150 bucks, give or take, which again isn't cheap but isn't crazy, crazy expensive. Uh, I know Elite FTS sells a band set, which I believe is a mini band, a light band, an average band, and a heavy band. So so a pair of each of those. So eight bands total uh, and a pair of, of each of those resistances. If you add up how much total resistance you can get out of just that set of eight bands on the little like band to resistant conversion chart they have on the site, that's like, I think it's 649 band or 649 pounds of band resistance which, dude, if you can bust out, like, sets of 30 squats with that, then, like, you know, you're probably Ray Williams and probably don't listen to this podcast. But virtually anyone else listening to this, if you just have that band set, you can now do good mornings, training a similar motor pattern as as deadlifts would, and you can do squats, and they're fucking hard. Um, I trained like that for an entire summer of my life, actually, so... Um, I went to, to a nerd camp one time. It's, it's a long story. Uh, we weren't allowed off of the site and there wasn't a gym on site. And so I just took my band set. Uh, and I, so at the end of that summer, I was slightly weaker than when I went, uh, just because I didn't have access to a bar and like the motor pattern and the resistance curve is slightly different. So I lost, I lost like some crispness under a barbell, but within like 
two weeks I was hitting PRs. So like I, I was getting stronger in a general sense. The motor pattern was slightly different, so it didn't transfer perfectly as soon as I could get back under the bar. But for 10 weeks, it was productive training. And like I said, within two or three weeks, I was hitting PRs again. Um, so with just body weight, you're pretty set. Your back might get a little weaker. Your traps might get a little weaker. But overall, you can get the job done. If you get a pull-up bar, upper back training becomes quite a bit easier. If you have access to water jugs, which you probably do, um, you can do virtually anything you would use dumbbells for. Um, and then if you get adjustable dumbbells, you know, you can do, you can do anything you, you could do with dumbbells. I don't need to make a list for you. <laughs> and then, uh, and then if you get, um, if you get some like lifting bands as well, uh, which again, you can get a very good set for 150 bucks. Or if you want to roll the dice with a cheaper Amazon vendor, you can get them for even less. Um, you can do everything. You can you can keep your back in shape. Um, so for for somewhere between zero and two hundred dollars, you're set. Uh, and you know, if you were never going to go back to a gym again, then you know you may want to invest money in a full home gym setup. But for a few weeks or a few months of quarantine and living in your apartment, you can you can do incredibly productive training for somewhere between zero and 200 bucks. Definitely. So like, like I said, keep an eye out for that article over at strongerbyscience.com. Um, we're hoping to get that information out pretty, pretty soon here. Um, we're about to move on from coronavirus related topics and never come back. At least that's, that's the plan until we've got some good news. Um, but because it is such an important topic, I do want to make sure that we're super clear, kind of summarizing what we've gone over here. So, uh, when it comes to the coronavirus, uh, you know, first and foremost, if you're listening to this or if you're not listening to this, we hope you're safe and healthy and doing well. Um, obviously, the news is pretty, pretty bleak these days, so uh, we don't want to contribute any more to that than we have to. But we do uh, sincerely hope that you're doing well. We did talk a little bit about immune function. Again, there, there's nothing you can really do to like ultra supercharge your immune system, but we talked about some basic health-related behaviors that can play a supportive role in maintaining proper immune function. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about <laughs> products going around. We don't have an issue with people who put out good content about immune function, the immune system, and the inner, you know, the, uh, the interaction with nutrition or supplementation. That is not inherently a bad thing. That's not something that we're upset about. But the thing that, that we're really talking about is people who are purposefully exploiting fears and trying to turn that into profit. So don't fall prey to that. A lot of people are out there doing it. It's shameful, but, um, you know, yeah, that, that stuff's gross, but you know, good, normal health supporting habits. Um, you know, we talked about managing training load and stuff like that. And, uh, is there anything else we want to add before we move on there? I don't think so. No. So everybody take care of yourself. Oh, oh one other thing, uh, you know, listen to the big health organizations, World Health Organization, uh, you know, your, your local and national uh, authorities, you know, the stuff that they're telling us to do is not special, washing hands, social distancing, um, but, but listen to their guidelines, take it seriously, and do your best not only to keep yourself healthy, but keep the people around you healthy, even the people you don't know. Um, so that's pretty much all we have to say about it. We are completely moving on. And in order to do that, we're going to do a special segment of good news. Only good vibes, good news stories, and I'm going to start that. So, a cool story I saw the other day, um, not fitness related, but just good news in general. Uh, a person named Eleanor Lelou. Uh, it's a person who is running for a council seat in their local municipal government in France. And the unique thing about this story is that Eleanor has Down syndrome. And so she's running for public office. Again, it's a, a council seat in the local government. And she's running on a platform that's largely focused on uh, ac accessibility for people who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, and also people who have a, a variety of physical or intellectual disabilities. So it's just a, it's a really nice story, um, raises a lot of really positive awareness, advocates for accessibility uh, for a lot of people who, who really struggle with accessibility uh, in certain uh, public places. Um, and it helps with reducing some stigmas. Um, you know, something I've talked about a little bit uh, on, on the podcast in the past is working with Special Olympics. 
once again, I'm going to encourage anyone listening. If you ever have the opportunity, it's a really fantastic organization to get involved with. You're going to meet a ton of really awesome people. You are going to have a fantastic time. So if that opportunity ever presents itself, I very, very much recommend it. But really good story and uh, fingers crossed, hoping that Eleanor wins the election and secures that seat. That would be awesome. Uh, So mine is a little bit less personal to me, but I also thought it was very cool. So Dr. Seuss, Theodore Gazelle, um, that's how I've always pronounced his name. That's probably wrong. That's par for the course at this point. It's, it's kind of our brand. It's yeah. just mispronouncing names. It's, yeah. It's a pillar. So, uh, so Dr. Seuss um, unfortunately passed away in 1991, um, but he had some some notes and manuscripts lying about I believe the most recent Dr. Seuss book was published in 2015, and a new one uh, is scheduled to come out in September of this year. It is called Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum, and it is a book about art. Um, So I love Dr. Seuss. The first book I ever read uh, was a Dr. Seuss book, so not like the first book that someone read to me, but as I was learning how to read... um, I should remember which one it is, but I do vividly remember the first book that I could actually make it all the way through and pronounce all of the words, and my mom was so proud of me, uh, was a Dr. Seuss book. So I have have very good vibes, very positive associations with Dr. Seuss. Um, so it's cool that, that a new book of his is coming out and just that his legacy is, is being carried on. Um, a lot of good lessons in those books. So, man, Dr. Seuss books have so many good lessons in them, and they're less less just, like, preachy than, than current children's books are, I feel like. I mean, to an adult, the message still, like, hits you over the head. And the thing was, they may have not been effective. Like, maybe kids were just too dense to understand what Dr. Seuss was trying to say. I like to believe they weren't, but come to think of it, when I was, like, six years old, I didn't know what any of them were about, except that there were pretty pictures. So whatever. They could have been very ineffective <laughs> as, as as like a, a didactic, like moral lesson teaching strategy for young kids. But I, I feel like they were more artful than a lot of children's books are these days. I love Dr. Seuss. New Dr. Seuss book called Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum is coming out in September. And to me, that feels like good news. Yeah, I... I... I think I mentioned uh, when we were talking before recording, uh, I actually, I think I was in Portland, but I'm not certain, but uh, I was just kind of wandering around. I was visiting for a few days and I saw an art studio and uh, just popped in to check out some of the art. And it was a bunch of like Dr. Seuss art that was, uh, it wasn't like, you know, the... uh, (laughs) It wasn't like the greatest hits, right? It was like Mm -hmm. characters that never really found their way into a story, like real like deep track kind of stuff, Uh, you know, stuff you've never seen, but very much in his style. It was really, really cool. I believe it was in Portland that I saw it, but um, someone who lives in Portland will will let me know if I'm correct, I'm I'm sure. But uh, some of his art was just really, really cool. It Mm -hmm. it, it was a fun time, but yeah. So uh, I'm sure that's going to be a cool book. So if you're interested in more Dr. Seuss content, um, I think this is something that at this point a lot of people know, but is still somewhat unknown, at least to a fair amount of people, um, is either at the same time Dr. Seuss was publishing children's books or before he got into publishing children's books, one of the two. Uh, He was a nationally syndicated political cartoonist. So if you're interested in what Dr. Seuss had to say about things other than the Lorax or the cat in the hat. Uh, You can just Google Dr. Seuss political cartoons. They're pretty good. Um, And it it is very interesting because, you know, they're they're not children's books. They were, I believe, aimed at adults. Um, But they're still in the same art style. So if you've only been exposed to Dr. Seuss, the children's author... It's kind of fun, I think, just to Google Dr. Seuss political cartoons and check them out. Very nice. All right, Greg, you want to move on to the Q&A segment? Let's do it. So we're going to kick it off with a question for Eric from Bart. Bart asks, 
What is the evidence around nutrition and injury prevention or recovery? Specifically, is there any research on prolonged cuts and effects on injury risk? Thanks. Yeah, so there are a couple ways by which you could argue that cutting might not be awesome for injury risk, you know, could make, make a, a slight increase in injury risk. So one approach uh, logically looking at it is that potentially, if, if you're not really managing your training load effectively uh, and, and your tissues aren't really adequately recovering from the stressors you're putting on them from training, uh, you, you could argue that, you know, if the, uh, um, if the energy deficiency that you're imposing, you know, if, if you're taking a really big deficit, uh, you know, a really rapid approach to your weight loss, you could certainly argue that you're not giving the tissues an adequate opportunity to recover uh, between training sessions. Another thing that we've talked about, I don't remember if we've talked about it on the podcast or in a mass article, but uh, we, we've talked about the idea that when we are acutely fatigued, we can see a breakdown of our, our motor mechanics and higher forces getting diverted to passive non-contractile tissues. Um, so that fatigue causing form breakdown, causing unaccustomed loads on tissues that really aren't used to accommodating those types of loads. And so in those cases, we, we can see instances where if you are training really hard in a really big deficit uh, and inducing a great deal of fatigue during the session itself, you could potentially run into uh, a scenario that's likely to increase your chance uh, of an acute injury. So you can largely get around those two things by uh, properly managing your training load and recovery and properly managing your energy deficit. So, you know, it, it, we, we kind of view it as a binary thing. You're either cutting or you're not. But really, you know, there's a huge spectrum of exactly how large is that energy deficit. You know, if you're pushing it really, really hard, there's a good chance that you could increase the likelihood of, of injury to some extent. Um, but, but, you know, managing your training load properly, managing your fatigue, managing your overall energy deficit should set you up. You know, it, it's not like, oh, once you're in a deficit, you're getting hurt no matter what. You know, that, that's not at all the case. But you do want to keep those things in mind if you're trying to train hard through, you know, a pretty sizable energy deficit. Um, there are some more general guidelines about uh, basically if you're if you're concerned about injury prevention or recovering from injury, there's some general guidelines about how you should eat. Um, and uh, these were published in 2019 by Close and colleagues. And so the uh, the, the main highlights uh, that, that they talk about in this paper, first of all, making sure you have sufficient energy intake. And so that kind of goes along with what I was saying about making sure, yeah, you can be in an energy deficit to some extent, but the question is how large a deficit. The larger it is, the more likely we're going to run into issues with either injury occurrence or recovery from previous injury. Uh, number two, making sure you have sufficient protein. And I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, we no longer have to work hard to convince you to eat a lot of protein. That That's kind of part of what you sign up for. I hope so. Um, another thing, uh, some of the specific nutrients they, they point out, uh, making sure you have sufficient intake of vitamin C, vitamin D, copper, omega-3 fatty acids, and calcium. Uh, this just a handful of, of, of the really key ones that they, that they highlight in the paper. Now, it's really, really important to stress this. If someone says like, hey, want to be healthy? Don't be deficient in vitamin C. That does not mean, you know, 10,000 milligrams a day and now you're superhuman. All they're saying is don't have deficiencies. Once you have adequate amounts, you're good. Uh, so uh, th they do mention a few potential supplements that could have utility for people who are, again, really focused in on either prevention or recovery from previous injury. Uh, the supplements that they, that they talk about mostly include creatine, uh, gelatin or collagen, vitamin D, fish oil, and just a basic multivitamin mineral supplement. So uh, again, the, the idea with the vitamin D and the, the vitamin and mineral supplements is just making sure that you don't have an underlying deficiency. Uh, again, same thing with fish oil. I mentioned omega-3 fatty acids. If you do happen to have low dietary intake of omega-3s, a fish oil supplement is a fantastic idea. Uh, creatine, pretty self-explanatory, uh, has positive effects on a variety of soft tissues, including muscle and tendon. Uh, and then gelatin and collagen, uh, if you're a mass reader, we've, we've covered some previous uh, research on gelatin and collagen. Uh, generally speaking, seems to have, 
either a neutral to positive effect on the recovery of connective tissues following uh, stressors induced by exercise. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not ready to, to call gelatin or collagen a lifesaver yet, but th there is good evidence that they, again, have a neutral to positive effect when it comes to helping those soft tissues. You know, if, you, if you're worried about the recovery of, you know, tendons and ligaments, stuff like that after exercise, bone as well, uh, gelatin and collagen might be helpful in that regard. So those are kind of the basic things to focus on if you are trying to really fine tune your nutrition and injury or recovery uh, are at the forefront of your mind. All right, question for Greg. This one is from Edward Longshanks. The question is, should lifters with long limbs train differently uh, compared to someone who's kind of more normally proportioned? Uh, their words, not mine. Okay, someone with more typical <laughs> proportions. Uh, does this advice change if the focus is strength versus hypertrophy? Yeah, so um, just in general, uh, let me note on the front end that neither of us are particularly tall. So I'm about 6'3", Eric's about 6'1", but not like super tall by any means. Um, and I think we're fair. I think we're both fairly normally proportioned. Um, I have slightly short arms and slightly long legs, but both within like one standard deviation of average proportions. Uh, and I think the same applies to you as well. So I'm not necessarily speaking from personal experience here. However, um, my wife is my primary training partner. She is fairly tall and has pretty long limbs, uh, actually super long limbs. And uh, I have a fair amount of experience training athletes. And a lot of them were football players, but a fair amount of them were basketball players. So they were quite tall and quite gangly. Um, and what I will note is um, a lot of the things I'm about to say, they're going to be phrased in a way that they're for people with relatively long limbs, but a lot of those people will also just be people who are tall in general. Uh, one thing to note about human body proportions, this is kind of a fun fact, I think, is that um, there is a positive association between being tall and having long limbs relative to total body height. The reason for that is, so if you compare adult proportions to baby proportions, um, limbs are a larger total per percentage of body height for adults than they are for babies. Babies have relatively long sh torsos and short little limbs. And then when you're growing, uh, bones elongate at growth plates, and the growth plates of your long bones, so, you know, the bones of your arms, the bones of your legs, uh, those growth plates are are more active and produce a, a larger or a greater increase in length in those long bones than the growth plates of your vertebra do. So during childhood and adolescence, as you are growing and getting taller, um, you have a larger proportional increase in, in length of the bones of your arms and legs than you do the length of the bones of your torso. And so people who wind up tall generally that trend is going to continue. So someone who's six foot five on average is certainly going to have longer arms and legs than someone who's five foot 10 or whatever. Um, but also their arms and legs will probably be longer relative to their body height than someone who is shorter or more normal size. So everything I'm about to say, it doesn't necessarily matter how tall you are, just you know, for people who have long limbs relative to body height, but that will, on average, tend to be taller people. So just wanted to start with that fun little fact about human development. Um, so for starters, uh, talking about modifying exercises in general, so for squats. Uh, if you're someone who's relatively tall, you may want to play around with wider stance squats. So if you're someone who's tall, someone who has long legs, that's going, that's going to mean... Uh, that's going to mean one of two things. Either to hit depth, you have to lean further forward, or to hit depth, you need more forward knee travel for any given stance with an amount of hip uh, abduction. And so if you can squat with a wider stance and you can get your knees out further, that effectively makes your, your thighs shorter in the sagittal plane. And so that means you don't need quite as much forward knee travel, 
or quite as much forward lean to squat to depth. Um, so it's going to make your, your squat a little bit more efficient, and it means generally that you don't have to lean quite as far forward to be able to hit depth. Um, so it's worth playing around with a wider stance. If that isn't doable for you, um, if you can't, if you just can't do a wider stance because your hips aren't built that way, um, then there's no shame in just using a shorter range of motion. Um, still continue to squat. If you, you know, if, if to hit depth that requires a ton of forward lean and maybe some spinal flexion in the process, you'll be perfectly fine just cutting your squats a little bit above parallel. Um, you know, that's obviously not legal for powerlifting, but just for, you know, general training purposes, that is just fine. Um, so that's from a strength perspective. From a hypertrophy perspective, that may mean that squats aren't necessarily the best hypertrophy exercise for you because you won't be able to train your quads through that long range of motion. So if any of that applies to you, you can't squat to depth, uh, a wide stance squat isn't really amenable to you, then you know doing stuff like leg press or hack squats or anything that allows you to train your quads through a longer range of motion might then be um, more feasible and a better exercise for quad hypertrophy. Um, for deadlifts, one of the things I have generally found, which may not necessarily be intuitive if you watch strength sports, is that I have found that for taller people, um, again, much like the wide stance squats, if their hips allow it, sumo deadlifts tend to, tend to work quite well. Um, so, so the reason I gave that caveat is for power lifters, you tend to see sumo deadlifts disproportionately in the lower weight classes, and you tend to see uh, conventional deadlifts disproportionately in the higher weight classes. And then if you look at like World Strongest Man competitors, virtually all of them, well, not virtually, all of them deadlift conventional. The reason you see that with strongman is because you have to deadlift conventional and strongman. Strongman has weird rules and rules that change event to event and competition to competition. But one of the things that's, that's a constant is that sumo deadlifts aren't allowed. Um, so we don't know how many pro strongmen would be better sumo deadlifters if that was allowed, A. And then B, with power lifters, um, one of the things that I don't have data to support, but I've just seen from coaching a lot of people, is that folks who are more gangly, like who have longer arms and legs, tend to do better with sumo deadlifts on average. Um, but you aren't necessarily going to see them as super successful, like 275 or super heavyweight powerlifters, because, you know, if you're 6'3 and have super arm longs or super long arms and legs, unless you're Brad Gillingham, who's a freak, you're probably not going to be an incredibly successful powerlifter on the international stage. So one, the most successful super heavies tend to not be incredibly tall. Um, and two, they tend to be, they tend to have proportions more similar to shorter people that are more amenable to squatting and benching. Um, and so one of the things you see when you actually look at trends in the data is that at least in the IPF, uh, deadlift numbers increase up to uh, either the 93 or the 105 kilo class, and then they're pretty much flat from there. Uh, 120s and super heavies don't tend to deadlift much more um, than, than the 93s and 105. So you tend to see in the higher weight classes people succeeding more if they have an archetypal bench and squat build, which means kind of shorter limbs than average. And then they struggle a little bit more in the deadlift, and maybe those folks do a little bit better with the conventional deadlift than the sumo, but I find that a lot of tall people uh, and, and just people with, with disproportionately long limbs do tend to do better with the sumo deadlift. Um, and then again, just like I said for the squat, if your hips just don't allow for sumo, if that, if that just doesn't work with you, um, not legal for powerlifting, but there is absolutely no shame in training your deadlift through a shorter range of motion. Or if it's a little bit more comfortable to get down to the bar with more forward knee travel, it is also perfectly fine to do trap bar deadlifts. Um, so those would be two things that I would generally recommend. In terms of, of hypertrophy modifications for 
training the posterior chain for someone with relatively long limbs, I don't really think you need any. <laughs> Just because both for, for pulling movements and for squatting movements, you're probably going to have more forward lean on average and your, your lifts are going to wind up looking more hip dominant than the typical person anyways. So if you're training heavy compound lower body exercises, your glutes and hamstrings and entire po posterior chain are probably getting plenty of work already. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in more glute or hamstring growth, anything that one would ever recommend for glute and hamstring growth would apply to you. But in terms of how one would need to modify just normal day-to-day -day training for those purposes, I don't necessarily think you're going to need to on average. Um, and then last thing is bench. So if you're someone who struggles with bench because you have really long arms, um, <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's not really too much you can say about that. Um, range of motion is going to be longer. Uh, that's going to make the lift more challenging. It might inherently make it a little bit more beneficial for hypertrophy. So one of the things we talked about on the podcast previously and that we had a, an article on Stronger by Science about is how if someone has a very, very efficient bench setup, bench may essentially turn into a partial range of motion exercise, which, you know, is great for putting up big numbers on the platform, but may not necessarily be ideal for hypertrophy. If you're someone who has really long arms relative to body height, and especially if you're tall and just have really long arms in an absolute sense, you don't need to worry about that. So like bench is going to be fantastic as a hypertrophy exercise. Um, if you're trying to optimize things for strength, really the same things that I would recommend to everyone would apply to you. So, you know, see if you're comfortable with the maximum legal width grip. So 81 centimeters. So pointer fingers on the little grip rings. Uh, try to work on your arch especially if you want to be a competitive bencher, if you have really long arms, uh, technique is going to be really, really important to you. So trying to minimize range of motion is a good idea for everyone trying to optimize weight that they can lift on the platform. That is going to be doubly or triply true for you. So working on your arch, um, working on really dialing in your technique, trying to get comfortable with a maximum legal width grip, um, you'll probably still be at some degree of disadvantage just because you have really long arms, but those things will, to the greatest degree possible, help narrow the playing field and are probably going to be more important for you than they would be for most people. Um, and like I, like I mentioned for both squats and deadlifts, if you have really, really long arms and you also have not the biggest rib cage, um, it bench may not be the perfect exercise for you so if you're if you're benching and bringing the bar to your chest for most people most of the time that is a perfectly safe range of motion to go through uh, but if you're someone with arms that are so long that by the time the bar reaches your chest your elbows are like a foot and a half behind your spine um, that's probably going to require I don't want to say probably, that very well could require more shoulder flexion or shoulder extension that would then would necessarily be advisable under heavy load. Um, so I wouldn't say go out and make, you know, any any rash changes right now. But if if you have super long arms and you find that bench isn't super comfortable for your shoulders, again, this isn't legal for powerlifting. But just like bench press can be a partial range of motion exercise for some people, it may be a greater than maximum range of motion exercise for you. Um, and in that case, partials would be just fine. So something like benching to a one board, or if you have super long arms, maybe a two board, um, that would be good. Something like floor press, even though that would probably still be a partial range, range of motion exercise, floor press would be fine. Um, you know, benching partials to pins with pins set maybe two or three inches off of your chest. If you find that that's a little bit more comfortable for your shoulders, that would be uh, a good exercise modification to make. Um, and much like I said for, um, for deadlifts, since you have long arms, <laughs> if you're benching, you don't need to worry about range of motion uh, as far as hypertrophy is concerned. 
So bench in and of itself would, would probably be a great hypertrophy exercise for your pecs and, and really for anyone to a lesser degree, your triceps. Um, so, so I don't necessarily think you would need to change your approach to pec growth if you have particularly long arms. Um, just kind of from an aesthetic perspective, uh, and again, no judgment, but if you have long limbs, you need more total muscle to look big and impressive. So just in a general sense, I'd probably recommend more direct arm work anyways. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you have super long arms, you may need 17 inch arms to look the same as 15 inch arms on someone else. Um, so just, just in general, doing more arm training is probably a smart thing to do um, if you're someone who trains for aesthetics. But, uh, but yeah, those are... Those are my general thoughts. In general, I wouldn't necessarily make huge changes right off the bat, but but just to recap a little bit, for squats, they may not agree with your hips, but it's worth at least playing around with a wider stance squat. If that is comfortable for you, that will probably be the way to go. Every so I like I said, I've trained a fair amount of basketball players and a few uh, volleyball players who were quite tall and had long legs. Everyone who tried the wide stance squat, if their hips allowed wide stance squats, they would come back to me immediately and say like, holy shit, my complete, like my total outlook on squats has changed. So you may not have hips that allow that, but if your hips do allow that, play around with a wider stance, play around with, uh, with, with more hip abduction. So getting your knees out further, if that feels good, that's probably going to help squats a lot. But again, if that doesn't work, no shame in partial range of motion and kind of do leg press, hack squat, something that allows you to train your quad through a slightly longer range of motion for a hypertrophy perspective. For posterior chain stuff or for pec stuff, you don't necessarily need to do anything crazy for hypertrophy. Uh, for deadlifts, at least give sumo a shot. Um, if sumo doesn't feel good, conventional doesn't feel good, just do trap bar. Trap bar's fine, partials are also fine. And then again, for bench, you very well may need to, to do partial range of motion as well. If you're someone who wants to compete in powerlifting, maximum legal width, at least give it a shot. Really play around with your bench arch. Try to make it as big as possible. Um, and just as a general bro tip, do more arm work. Uh, your arms probably need to get pretty big. <laughs> a quick uh, technical note. Uh, gangly. That is the preferred medical term, right? I know that came up a few times. We try to stay away from the jargon, but but that 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 is the medical term, I believe, correct? Or uh, daddy long legs esque. Yes, that that's yeah. another one. Perfect. I think that's derived from from the Latin. <laughs> Probably so. I mean, it's either Greek or Latin roots with all of these medical terms. Who can say? Yeah. All right. Uh, so we have two protein questions for Eric coming up next. The first is from Hall BC. Uh, they ask, there are huge discrepancies with protein guidelines. Official nutrition organizations often recommend around 0.36 grams per pound, which is obviously too low if your goal is to build muscle and strength. However, I hear some bodybuilders eating four or 500 grams per day. Where is the sweet spot from your personal experience? Uh, and secondly, can you overdo protein intake? The second question here is from Hassan. Uh, Hassan asks, uh, for my total daily protein intake, should I only count proteins from animals and dairy sources? Uh, 100 grams of oats has about 12 grams of protein, but should I count that as, say, 6 grams because of the protein quality? What about bread, peas, nuts, seeds, etc.? So should you count uh, animal sources of protein the same as plant sources of protein in terms of meeting total daily protein targets? Yeah, let's talk total amount first, and then we'll talk about, you know, complete versus incomplete protein. So uh, we just had a paper come out. When I say we, I mean uh, Brandon Roberts, Eric Helms, me, and Peter Fitchin. Uh, we just had a paper come out called Nutritional Recommendations for Physique Athletes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's oriented toward physique athletes, but it's basically anyone with physique-related goals in mind. Uh, you know, you don't have to take every uh, every guideline to the extreme and take everything to the stage. You could still implement this stuff. Uh, and we, we talked, uh, you know, between us, we talked about the different uh, protein guidelines you see out there, what the what the uh, what the evidence tells us in terms of what protein values seem to really get the job done. 
And what we what we uh, shared in the paper is basically that there is a range, a, a pretty broad range, where it looks like if you're within that range, you've got enough. You know, you've got enough protein to feel good about, and, and you can kind of rest assured that you've that you're maximizing what you're doing in the gym. You're eating enough protein to support your physique goals. And from our perspective, that range was 1.6 to 2.7 grams per kilogram per day of protein. Um, however, we also noted that there, there's really not much evidence to suggest that high protein, high protein intake is going to negatively impact things. So we felt you might as well skew yourself a little toward the top end of that range. So what we, what we generally recommend is 1.8 to 2.7 grams per kilograms per day for most people. Finding yourself somewhere in that range, uh, you're going to have more than enough. You know, I, I've seen people in the past recommend uh, 1.6 to 2.2. We just kind of shifted that upward a little bit based on the evidence and based on, you know, what's the downside of undershooting it versus what is the theoretical downside of overshooting it. And based on uh, illicit funding from big big protein manufacturers, right? No, no, those are those are very good people that funded that. <laughs> um, that's sarcasm. Uh, okay, so <laughs> it's sarcasm. They're terrible people. <laughs> yeah, they are awful, awful people. Um, so, so that's that's the uh, the kind of guideline that we put out there. But we also mentioned, uh, you know, the theoretical downside of undershooting your protein is you left some gains on the table. That sucks. You know, that, that's why we're looking over these details is because we don't want to leave gains on the table. The theoretical downsides of going a little too high with protein are pretty negligible. The only thing we mentioned is, you know, some people want to go above that 2.7 grams per kilogram per day. Uh, and in some cases, that can help if you're trying to mitigate hunger, really hedge your bets. If you're like pretty lean and cutting hard and you really want to make sure you retain every ounce of muscle, uh, maybe you want to skew even higher than 2.7. The only time it really becomes problematic, you know, you can go up to 3.5 grams per kilogram per day and still feel pretty good about it. The only issue is at a certain point, especially if you're dieting, you can run into a situation where you're eating so much protein that you're displacing your fats and your carbs in the diet. So in order for you to, you know, keep your caloric intake in the proper range, you're eating so much protein that you're unable to get sufficient amounts of fat or carbohydrate. That's one potential downside. Another potential downside of going too high with the protein is the other end of the spectrum. Maybe you're trying to bulk up and you're noticing like, I just cannot eat this many calories because a lot of times people with high protein diets, they, they tend to find that it can be very satiating and that they feel very full on a high protein diet. Um, and so some of Jose Antonio's papers where they put people on really high protein intakes like as high as like four point, I think like 4.4 .4 grams per kilogram. Yeah, I think that was the highest. The, the main thing that they'll note in those studies as like a little side effect is like some people are just like, D I'm way too full. I feel gross all the time, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but so there are some potential downsides, but it's usually not until you get into the really high, uh, really high intake. So generally speaking, 1.8 to 2.7, you can feel really confident knowing that you're not leaving gains on the table. Uh, and, and you're probably not going to run into any issues, certainly no health related issues within that range, assuming that you're an otherwise healthy person. Uh, just those little considerations of, you know, managing the appetite and making sure you're getting enough fat and carbohydrate as well. Now, I have see, I, I've tended to see, uh, practically speaking, that when you see the really high protein intakes, like the question I think mentioned, like 400, 500 grams per day. A lot of times you see that in the bodybuilding world and particularly in the not natural bodybuilding world uh, where, where there are some uh, drugs in, at, at play. Dude, that was that was the stock recommendation of, uh, ah, shit, what was the name of that forum? Uh, Dante Trudell's people. Intense muscle. I think yeah. that I think that's what it was. I, I posted on there for like four months at one point. Um, but dude, that was that was the the DC recommendation um 500 grams a day doesn't matter how big you are oh. uh it's the magic number everyone should eat 500 grams of protein per day dude i did that for like four or five months oh buddy so one i gained a ton of weight because i was in college at the time um i had no income whatsoever i was 
I was destitutely poor. Yeah. Um, and so I was trying to, to kind of guesstimate 500 grams of protein per day uh, from food from the school cafeteria. Um, and so I would get as much like lunch meat, turkey, and ham as they would give me. But, you know, there's a limit to that. And then I had a... I had a good relationship with several of the people working in the cafeteria and they would just load me up. But otherwise they would give me like four or five slices of turkey and ham and then send me on my merry way and say, you know, try to get your 170 grams of protein you're trying to get in at this meal from some other source. Um, And then really the next best bet in the cafeteria was skim milk. Yeah. So I would drink an enormous amount of skim milk, but skim milk still has about one gram of carbs per gram of protein so yeah it's usually more it's usually like 12 carbs and eight protein i think something like that i don't know it it still has a fair amount of carbs in it so that that was my next best route but it would still guarantee like minimum five six hundred grams of carbs per day uh and you know there you can one can only drink a finite amount of skim milk um so then anything else that i would get in the food lines you know would have a fair amount of fat in it because you know it's it's a cheap school cafeteria like it is what it is um so dude i was getting in 500 grams of protein a day but i was conservatively eating dude if i said four thousand, i guarantee you that undershoots it it was probably five six thousand calories a day yeah it's probably higher than four it was a shit show yeah um all of which is to say i don't think someone needs to go that high and (laughs) and if you do go that high do it when you have a stable income and you can buy protein powder and fucking egg whites and lean meats. Don't try to eat 500 grams of protein per day in a school cafeteria. I I did that. I made that mistake. So you don't have to. It was not. It was not a good time on any level whatsoever. So our our dining hall back in the day, uh, there were a lot of options. It was like all you could eat, like omelets and eggs and chicken breasts, like. You could have made it work, uh, depending on your dining hall situation. Dude, that's because you went to Ohio State. I did. It was a lovely place. <laughs> I went to a tiny Christian school in the middle of nowhere. Our, uh, so I don't want to sound like I'm talking bad about the people who worked in the cafeteria. They were all lovely. They were fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But Aramark, not my favorite company. They're not good. I don't know what that company is. They were... They were the people who like ran the school cafeteria. Like the school uh, had okay. a yeah. had a contract with them. Yeah. Dude, fuck Aramark. It was <laughs> it was the worst. Every everything about I'm not gonna go on an Aramark rant right now. I'm sure I will at some point. I had forgotten how much I hated Aramark. I hadn't thought about that goddamn company for probably like five <laughs> years. But dude, fuck Aramark. They're the worst. Fair enough. Um <laughs> So usually when you see those intakes, like four hundred, five hundred it's usually not necessarily in the natural side of bodybuilding. And I think, I think a lot of people are under the impression, like, because you're on anabolics, you're having all this additional protein synthesis. And like, you got to feed into that with all the raw materials required. I'm extremely skeptical that it would move your protein needs that much. Um, I've, I've also heard people argue the opposite that like, Oh, you're on anabolics. You don't even need that much protein. Cause like, the drugs will do it. Uh, I don't think that really makes a lot of sense to me either. I I think probably I'm, I'm really curious. I haven't looked into it super closely. I would think maybe if anything, you would just shift your protein needs a little bit higher on drugs, a little, what what do you think? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't change it much, you know, like it's like you're either going to initiate the synthesis or you're not. I I can't imagine, but I I think if I had to guess, I think that's probably the logic behind a lot of it. Is mm-hmm. like, ah, I'm on drugs. I need to build proteins. Better have some amino acids around. But you're not building that much more. Like, like that's pretty crazy. But uh, but anyway, I would say, regardless of your situation, 1.8 to 2.7 is probably a very safe range for most uh, in terms of making sure you're getting enough and not displacing other important nutrients. Um, regarding protein quality, incomplete proteins... If you're in that range, 1.8 to 2.7, you're not just getting enough, but you're probably getting a little bit more than enough. Like that's, again, the range is supposed to be like a safe range where you feel really good about your intake. If you're eating a mixture of complete and incomplete proteins, 
you, you're probably getting all the essential amino acids you need. You're probably getting all the leucine per meal that you need. And it's probably not, uh, not critical to get that, uh, you know, get out the magnifying glass and start sorting through your protein sources and saying, well, that's a good source and that's about 70% of a good source and that's about 45% of a good source. You're probably fine if you're up in that range. I would say this though, if you are 100% vegan, uh, or if you eat very, very minimal animal products and the overwhelming majority of your proteins do come from non-animal sources, in that, uh, in that circumstance, I would recommend probably bumping your total protein, uh, pr total protein intake up a little bit just to accommodate for the fact that all of the protein sources are a little bit lower in quality. Um, you know, there, there's a great article on this on the site about uh, plant-based protein sources at Stronger by Science, uh, basically how to arrange your diet if you're on a plant-based diet and, and not consuming animal products to a large degree. Um, and that's the same recommendation is just skew yourself a little bit toward the higher end of the recommendation. So maybe instead of just coming in at 1.8, you say, I'm going to shoot a little higher. I'm going to get up in the 2.2, 2.4, 2.7 range just to account for the, the fact that these are all incomplete sources. So I don't think it's it, it's worth stressing over the exact amino acid profiles and and getting super, super, you know, into the weeds on that, getting really into the details. But uh, I would say just move yourself a little bit up toward the higher end of that spectrum just to be safe and you should be totally fine. All right, a uh, question for Greg here. And this question is from Charlie. Based on the recent article about strength and range of motion in the bench press, do you think there is enough evidence to justify modifying training for competitive power lifters? For example, incorporating some bench pressing with a flatter arch and narrower grip uh, for some portion of training. Uh, so j basically just curious if you think that uh, people should... Uh, basically have some dedicated training with a longer range of motion in their bench pressing. Yeah, I would say so. And I would also say just kind of like based on how this question is phrased, do you think there's enough evidence to justify modifying training? I wouldn't even necessarily view it as a modification, um, mostly because... I but before we get into it, do you mind telling us what that article was about? Uh, strength and range of motion in the bench press? Yeah, so essentially, um, there was a study that came out which compared strength gains uh, for people benching through a full range of motion, through a two-thirds range of motion, so like the top two-thirds of the range of motion, and a one-third range of motion, so just like the top third of the range of motion. And it was looking at uh, strength gains through all three of those range of motion. So, you know, the group that that trained through a full range of motion would have their full range of motion, two thirds range range of motion, and one third range of motion, one RMs tested pre and post training. Same thing for all three groups. And what that study found overall is that uh, the full range of motion group had the largest strength gains through not just a full range of motion, but also through a partial range, through both partial ranges of motion as well. So the full range of motion group also gained the most strength through a two thirds range of motion and also gained the most strength through a one third range of motion as well. So it, it pretty much cleaned house for all of the results. Um, and so in, in my, uh, I don't want to call it analysis. That makes it sound way too stilted and formal in my write up of that study. Um, one of the things I speculated is that the subjects weren't super, super well trained. So they had some prior training experience, but you know, they weren't all binging like 405 or anything like that. Um, and so I, I speculated that, uh, they didn't assess hypertrophy in that study, but it's pretty likely that the group training through the longest range of motion also had the most muscle growth, both in terms of, uh, pecs and triceps and probably front delts as well. Um, and so that that was probably driving the results there. Um, and so, I mean, like my answer to this question wouldn't just rely on that one study. So, so we have pretty good evidence just generally that you don't necessarily need to train through a maximal range of motion, like the longest possible range of motion to maximize muscle growth. But if you, if you, 
restrict range of motion too much, it probably will be counterproductive for muscle growth. So, you know, just just to put numbers on this, if you have 140 degrees of usable range of motion of elbow flexion, say, uh, you probably don't necessarily need to do curls through that entire 140 degree range of motion. Um, like 120 very well may be fine. But if you're only going through, say, 70 degrees, that's probably insufficient. And so the thing with bench press is, is like I talked about before, bench pressing for people with really, really long arms. If you don't have really, really long arms, a full range of motion bench press is already arguably a partial range of motion exercise, at least for a fair amount of the prime movers. So it, it may be close to a full range of motion for the pecs, but probably not quite. So in terms of shoulder horizontal adduction, um, like if you were just doing flies, your elbows could probably get a little bit further below your shoulders doing flies than they would if you were doing bench press. Um, it's certainly not a full range of motion for your triceps unless you're benching with a super close grip. So at the bottom of like a normal competition bench press, you're nowhere near close to, to maximal elbow flexion. Um, and possibly the same thing for front delt. So most people do have a, a pretty fair amount of shoulder extension in the bench press. So it, so it is probably somewhere pretty close to full range of motion for the front delts, but not completely full range of motion. So anyways, um, a, a, a competition bench press, especially if it's a wide grip and a big arch, is arguably a partial range of motion exercise in the first place. Um, and so the the authors of the particular study I wrote about and like my personal feelings on, on the subject as well uh, are that maybe it's beneficial to do some some portion of your bench press training through a longer range of motion than you would typically get from a you know traditional competitive bench setup with a maximum legal grip width and a bunch of arch etc um, and so Going back to Charlie's question, he asked, do you think there's enough evidence to justify modifying trainer training for competitive powerlifters? And I would argue that it, it wouldn't necessarily be a modification most of the time. Because um, if you look at, at most successful lifters bench press programs, you generally see close grip bench in there as well. Like that's, that is a very, very common uh auxiliary or supplemental lift for the bench press like I think most people do some close grip training um or like they they do some dumbbell bench and generally dumbbell bench is going to have a longer range of motion than barbell bench um I talked about how it, it's probably fairly close to full range of motion for the pecs but pretty far off it for the triceps most lifters do some sort of dedicated tricep training as well so I wouldn't necessarily argue that this would be a large modification, but what I would say is that if all of the bench press training you do is just with your competition setup, especially if you have a very efficient competition setup and you have reasonably short arms, or at least not super long arms, then it probably would be worth um, doing something with a longer range of motion in your program somewhere. So that could be, you know, you go through your full competition setup, but you just do it close grip. That's necessarily going to increase range of motion. Um, or, you know, you could just do some of your benching with a smaller arch if you're someone who has a really big arch. Um, something I personally really enjoy, both because it increases range of motion and it increases the range of motion where the lift is challenging, is benching with feet up. So you're minimizing leg drive, you're making it harder at the bottom of the lift, which is you know, A, probably where stress to the musculature is going to be most beneficial for hypertrophy in the first place, and two, where it, where it's most important to be able to generate force and power to get that bar moving off of your chest. So I really love feet up bench, um, and you just simply can't get as big of an arch when you're doing that. So uh, I, think, I think all of those exercises are great. Another one, which I've talked about on the podcast before, which I absolutely love, is a low incline bench. Um, that's going to be a fairly similar motor pattern, but it's also going to have a longer range of motion because, you know, even with a slight incline, just 15, 20 degrees, at that point, you're touching the bar to your chest. You're not touching it, you know, at or below your sternum. So, like, range of motion is going to have to be longer. Um, 
Another thing that I really, really like is uh, benching with a Cambered bar or a McDonald bar named after Mike McDonald, who, in my opinion, is probably the most uh, successful, at least male bench presser ever. Um, on the female side of things, it's it's hard to argue against Jennifer Thompson, but man, Mike McDonald, at one point, if my memory is correct, held the all-time world record in the bench press in four different weight classes, um, which which is wild. Um, and so he did a lot of bench with a, with a bar that had like a three or four inch camber that large of a camber might be overkill for a lot of people. But if, if there is like a three, four inch camber bar at your gym and you, you take that to a one board, so it's extending the range of motion by about two inches. I think that's an awesome supplemental lift for the bench press. Um, but yeah, for, for people who, especially have a really, really good competition bench setup where you've minimized range of motion, you have a great arch, you have a wide grip. Um, I do think that there's considerable benefit to doing some of your bench training with some sort of variation that allows for a longer range of motion. Like I said, I don't necessarily view that as a modification for most people because most people who do have that hyper-efficient bench setup are already doing something that trains their bench through a longer range of motion. But if, you know, if you just discovered the magic of a hyper-efficient bench setup and you're like, this is the bee's knees, I can, you know, I can bench 70 more pounds doing this. I'm never benching any other way again. Uh, it's worth rethinking that and maybe taking some weight off the bar and doing some sort of bench variation that, that does take you through a longer range of motion. Um, may not necessarily add weight to your max, say, next week or next month, but it will probably be beneficial for muscle growth, which will help you bench more, you know, over a moderate to longer period of time. Good stuff. All right. Next question we have for Eric is from Jordan Apfelbach, I believe. Um, so Jordan asks, question for Eric regarding, air quote, fat burners, close air quote. So currently I'm taking a stimulant-free fat burner and multiple ingredients, uh, Garcinia kombucha extract, green coffee bean extract, CLA, acetyl L-carnitine, and green tea leaf extract. Uh, and I feel like it helps me curb my appetite. However, I write in because I'm unsure if I've simply placeboed myself or if it's actually helping. Is there anything in the above ingredients that actually does anything, or am I just wasting my money? Yeah, so when it comes to those ingredients listed, I, I really haven't seen any super compelling evidence to suggest that they are like effective enough to really care about. Um, I generally don't push any kind of fat burner supplement, either for the purpose of increasing energy expenditure or reducing hunger. Uh, so if you've read the metabolic adaptation manual on the website, uh, I do talk a little bit a little bit about supplements. You actually made me add that part, which was good because I refer back to it all the time. Uh, but there are uh, there are a number of supplements that people suggest will increase their metabolic rate, their, therefore you know increase fat burning and help them get leaner. Some of the ones that come up a lot are uh, ephedrine, p-synephrine, also known as bitter orange. Yohimbine, caffeine, nicotine, and capsaicin. And in that metabolic adaptation manual, I walk through a couple of the main shortcomings for each of those. So, uh, for example, ephedrine is banned in many countries, uh, and you know there's been a lot of adverse events reported for it. So, you know, for me, that kind of takes it off my list. Um, ephedrine is banned in the U.S., right? As far as I'm aware, I, I think it is. So, yeah. so, so purified ephedrine is, I believe. You can get ephedra. Correct, yeah. But not just straight ephedrine. Yeah, yeah. So ephedrine itself, there, there have been a number of adverse events reported. And so uh, not not on my list of go-to supplements, that's for sure. Uh, Pisinephrine is basically uh, oversimplified, but it, it's basically a less potent, less effective version of ephedrine. Um, its side effects don't seem to be as potent, but neither do its effects that you actually want. <laughs> So, so, so if you took enough of it that it did actually behave like ephedrine, very well may be just as potentially problematic. I mean, I have no idea, but for me, it's just like, it's just on the list of no thanks. You know, it, it's either not going to work or you could try to 
push it into ranges that go beyond what are studied. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Yohimbine. Uh, Yohimbine actually can work uh, if you're going to do like fasted cardio and use it to support your, your uh, fasted cardio. Um, the problem is I usually don't recommend fasted cardio to people. So it does seem like you, you really want to use it for that particular purpose if you really want to maximize its benefits. I believe it's also on the WADA band list. Yeah, it might be. If, if, for me, the reason I'm not even certain about that is because, uh, uh, first of all, it it interacts with a lot of drugs. It has major quality control issues uh, when it comes to the dosing and products. But most importantly, uh, it's known to cause like from what I from what I can tell, like pretty notable anxiety symptoms in oh, a you, lot of people. You, I saw you smiling, and that did not go the direction I thought it would. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. It's also supposed to increase erections, right? Is that what you were thinking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I would not recommend taking it if you're going to be in public. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. But but for me, one of the reasons I would never really feel good about recommending it is I've heard that the the anxiety-related side effects can be quite notable depending on the person. Yeah. And it's just like, dude, for for a marginal effect on fat loss, why would I bother? Yeah, I'm, the the thing that got me is like, I'm not a very anxious person. I've tried Yohimbine before. Um, I quite like it as a stimulant, but I I like stimulants. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, in terms of of the other side effect, it was like being in middle school all over again, <laughs> to the point that that it was so annoying that even though I did uh enjoy the stimulant properties and, and th this is before it was banned yeah um even though i did enjoy it as a as a general stimulant dude it was it, it, it wasn't a small problem it was a big enough problem that it was just just fucking annoying um so yeah wouldn't wouldn't necessarily recommend it <laughs> fair enough uh nicotine so nicotine i mean I don't know many people who consider it a supplement necessarily, but over the counter, there's the gums and the patches and all that. Um, and from what I understand, uh, it, I think it can help people just as like a general stimulant can help with appetite regulation, stuff like that. Uh, the problem is obviously it, it's quite, quite addictive. Um, now, you could have a very interesting discussion about whether or not it's bad to be addicted to nicotine. Uh, that's not a discussion that I really have much interest in but but like you you could make the argument if i'm just chewing the gum or using the patches and not you know using carcinogenic dip or chew or inhaling combustion products vape niche baby <laughs> yeah or using some kind of vaping that's causing all sorts of scarring in my lungs that no one can explain uh but you know like is the nicotine itself if you are addicted to it how bad is that per se you know, because there's a lot of people walking around with caffeine addictions and we don't go like, ooh, that's that's really scary stuff. Uh, but generally speaking, to me, it seems like a, I would never feel comfortable telling somebody like, hey, why don't you go get addicted to nicotine? Because we want to, <laughs> you know, we want to get you lean, yeah. especially if we can get you lean without it. Uh, and then finally, I do want to talk about caffeine and capsaicin. I'm going to talk about them together because I view them the same way. Uh, you know, they're both quite accessible in a variety of foods and also supplements. They can both have modest effects on energy expenditure or appetite control. Um, but, you know, the effects just aren't that big, you know, like, yeah, maybe a little boost in energy expenditure, a little bit of help with appetite regulation, but the boost in energy expenditure is not big enough to really get excited about. And one of the things about, you know, the initial question asked about supplements that help reduce appetite or hunger, I actually advocate to people that are trying to lose weight to just get rid of the idea of hunger avoidance. You know, a lot of times we give hunger a lot more power than it deserves in the weight loss process. We, we like hide from it at all costs and think once the hunger shows up, I'm screwed. In reality, I think there is quite a liberating effect of saying, you know what, at a certain point in this diet, we are going to get hungry. And that's okay, because most hunger during a diet is not like, chew your arm off, you're so hungry type hunger. It's three or four hours after a meal, when it's almost time for the next meal, you notice, oh, I'm hungry again. That's normal. That's not something that, that we necessarily need to avoid or be afraid of or go all these different supplementation routes to try to 
uh, to try to fix. Now, two things I, I will use sometimes, you know, like because like, let's be honest, being hungry is not fun. So two things I have noticed that generally either reduce my hunger or at the very least reduce my, uh, reduce how much I want to eat would be using, you know, really spicy high capsaicin meals or drinking green tea. And the way I utilize those strategies in my diet, uh, very pragmatic, practical approach. If I eat a really spicy meal with a bunch of capsaicin in it, bunch of red pepper, chili pepper, black pepper, I make it really spicy. Um, you do notice the, the thermogenic effects are obvious. <laughs> you start sweating as you eat it. But I, I have noticed that my desire to eat things after that meal is just kind of naturally suppressed from that. Uh, could be due to the flavor profile, could be due to the actual, you know, some physiological component. To me, it doesn't really matter. I just know that I'm less likely to eat or be inclined to snack on things after that meal. Another thing I do with green tea, and by the way, there's research to support both of these, uh, either capsaicin or green tea in terms of reducing hunger later or reducing desire to eat later. Uh, what I've noticed with green tea, again, there's research to indicate there is some physiology happening, but w with the green tea, it's it's really obvious stuff. But like if I have coffee, I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast before, but like if I have coffee, I want a pastry or some fruit or anything sweet. Coffee goes with a million foods that are all delicious. If I have green tea, in my opinion, it goes with zero things. I don't want anything with green tea. And I like green tea, but it does not pair well with any food, in my opinion. So a lot of times when I'm prepping, if I do feel like I want to give myself a little crutch in terms of hunger avoidance, I'll just have some green tea. And, you know, honestly, the flavor alone is enough for me to say, like, eh, I'm not really going to eat anymore. Uh, but but like I said, there are some studies where they give people green tea or or high doses of capsaicin or some other capsaicinoid, and later, you know, a few hours later, they're less inclined to eat more. So I don't really recommend any special supplement uh, either for fat loss or for managing appetite. I know there are a couple out there, but I generally don't like to go down and, and say, oh, what if we try nine different herbal extracts and hopefully we won't get hungry later tonight. What I prefer as a much more sustainable approach is generally becoming comfortable with hunger. Um, but if I ever do feel like I need to lean on a crutch like that, I'll just do a really spicy uh, meal with a lot of capsaicin content, or I will go with, uh, with green tea either after a meal or between meals. And uh, I, I do have a lot of clients who suggest that those have been really helpful strategies for them as well. Uh, one thing to note with capsaicin, uh, if you abruptly, dramatically increase your capsaicin intake, uh, it's going to be spicy. Your mouth might uh, not like that. This is the hard-hitting content you come here for. <laughs> but no, the, the, the real part, you, you can run into some GI uh, uh, discomfort if you like really dramatically increase your intake of spicy foods. If you build your way up to it, it's, it's a little bit less notable, but don't just like go nuts in the spice cupboard and just throw red pepper on everything. Y you might run into some GI discomfort down the line. So keep an eye out for it. Makes sense. Okay. Do you want to do another one or do you want to go to, uh, to play us out? Let's call it there. All right. Yeah. We don't want Lindsay to get mad. She gets mad if we go over two hours and then we get in trouble. Correct. Okay. So uh, to play us out. Now, Greg, we've got uh, we've got two things here. We've got risotto. We're, and we're only doing the first one. We're doing risotto. Yeah. Okay. Let's go with that. All right. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to say? I don't know what the hell you're going to talk about. It's risotto. I I don't even know what risotto is. I I assume it's pasta. It's not. Uh, what? So let me educate you about risotto. So. I don't know. I guess technically you could make risotto with uh, with like orzo, like really small pasta. But risotto is traditionally a rice dish. Um, it's it's absolutely fantastic. And what I want to say about it is, if you're one uh, cooped up inside for for whatever reason, including reasons that we're no longer going to talk about on this podcast, uh, and you want to learn how to make a fun little dish that will impress people while not being all that difficult or you know if you're just trying to eat macro friendly food and you want something that is going to be macro friendly while also feeling and tasting quite indulgent risotto is a really really good option so risotto is essentially a creamy rice dish 
that is creamy even if you don't necessarily add anything creamy to it. So to start with, you want to get some rice. Um, man, I should have Googled this beforehand. I think risottos are traditionally made with short grain rice, but I think that's one of those tradition things that doesn't matter all that much. I've made it with both long and short grain rice. It comes out fine either way. There's also a bit of debate I've seen about whether or not you should rinse the rice before you, um, before you make risotto with it. I tend not to. What I have heard is that depending where you are in the world and where you're getting your rice from, there, there could possibly be a little bit of like dirt on the outside of it and it might give a, a gritty texture to your rice. That has never happened to me if I don't rinse rice beforehand. Typically, you, you would want to rinse rice additionally to get some of the starch off of the outside of it. So after you cook it, uh, each of the individual grains is more distinct. That is what most people prefer for whatever reason when they make rice. I don't care about that in general, and especially for risotto, if it's rice that isn't going to, to have dirt on it and isn't going to be gritty if I don't rinse it, I like to not rinse it because the starch on the outside of the rice helps make a, a thicker, lusher risotto in my experience. So here's how you make a damn good risotto. Um, so first off, if it's, if it's going to be kind of like a full meal in a dish instead of just a rice dish, if you're going to put meat in it, you would want to start by searing the meat. Once other things go in, you wouldn't want the pan to be hot enough to sear meat anymore. So if you're going to sear meat or if you're going to have anything else in your risotto that you would want seared, you're either going to need to sear it first or sear it in another pan and then add it back in just to cut down on the dishes. I would recommend searing it first. So you're going to sear the meat, high heat. I like throwing mushrooms in risotto. I love mushrooms as we previously talked about. I also like to sear my mushrooms. So start by searing your meat and or mushrooms and or other things that need to be seared. And then to continue building flavor, this isn't a necessary step, uh, but is one that I would generally recommend. You would want to turn the heat down once you've got sear on stuff that you want and throw your alliums in. So that would include things like onions, that would be things like garlic. If you want to throw leeks in, that would work. Shallots, alliums. So you'd throw the, alli the, the alliums in, you'd let them sweat for a couple minutes, let them start breaking down and releasing their flavors. And then something that I always do because I heard that it was the right thing to do, even though I doubt it actually matters, is after you've sweated your alliums, you throw the rice in that you're going to cook and let it toast a little bit. I've made risottos with and without toasting rice. I honestly can't tell a difference in flavor or texture, but I generally just toast them out of tradition. Um, doesn't really seem to make much of a difference, but you can throw the rice in a dry pan, you know, let it toast for a couple minutes, and then the actual risotto part starts occurring. Uh, you're going to get either water or stock. I would recommend stock, uh, chicken stock, beef stock, veggie stock, really any sort of culinary stock you want, depending on what else is going in the dish, is perfectly fine. It's going to let you get more flavor into the dish. Um, you can do this with just water, but I would recommend using stock. You start by adding the stock a little bit at a time to the pot that you're cooking your, your rice and meat and everything else in, and you just stir it. You stir it constantly. You don't have to be super vigorous about it. Just keep it moving around. Uh, that's going to help the, the rice A, start cooking, and B, start releasing starch. Uh, and then when you don't want to let it get dry looking, but once there's not much obvious uh, water or stock left in the pan, once you can drag your spatula across the bottom and it leaves a trail across the pan uh, or the pot, you just add in more stock, you keep stirring, and you repeat the process until the rice is cooked to the doneness you want it to be. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, risotto, people say, is, is a challenging dish, and a lot of people find it intimidating. Um, you could mess up your first risotto, I suppose, but honestly, it's not a challenging dish to make, especially if you have a decent nonstick pot. Um, the one way that traditionally people might say you could mess it up is by adding too much liquid at one time. Honestly, that's not that big of a deal. As long as you keep it moving, the rice is going to keep releasing starch and it's all fine. 
if you add way too much and the rice gets done while you still have a lot of liquid um, left in the mixture, you can just crank the heat up really, really hot, drive off the excess liquid pretty quickly. Um, so that's a pretty easy fix. You, you don't want to ever let it get too dry. So if it, if it starts getting dry and starts sticking to the pot, that could be a problem. But, you know, you make that mistake once and then you know how to avoid it from there. Just keep a little bit more liquid going the whole time. Um, and you want to end it when... So this is hard to describe, I guess. Like, basically, you just get an emulsion of the starch from the rice and all of the flavor compounds from everything else you threw in and the liquid from the stock. And it, it just feels like a very silky, creamy sauce, even though it's literally just starch and water. Um, and, you know, if, if you get it too dry, so, you know, you could, you could pick it up on a spoon and it maintains its shape, it's probably a little too dry. Just stir in a little bit more stock, it's fine. If it's too loose, like, you know, if it flows like a sauce, then you probably just want to keep it simmering a little bit longer until you get the liquid where, where you want it. Um, but I mean, literally just make one. <laughs> it's not too hard. If, if you make it and you're like, oh, this doesn't feel as, as silky and rich as I want it, just add more liquid next time or, or pull it with a little bit more liquid left next time. Um, and if it's like soup, if it's incredibly soupy, then just keep that in mind and, and just let more of the liquid simmer off next time you make it. Um, and it really is that easy. So it doesn't take that long to make a good risotto. So it's it's a little bit quicker than a pot of rice. So I think generally rice, without a rice cooker, I've never used a rice cooker. I should get one. Uh, but with, I have. They're pretty cool. How long does it take to make rice in a rice cooker? Oh, I forget. I, I had one when I was in college. My roommate had one. I use it all the time, but it's been it's been ages. No, oh, okay. It's so, hours, I think. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. I might be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I, it, it, I would just make it and come back a, a very gotcha. long time later. So yeah. so when you make rice in a pan on the stove, it takes about 30 minutes, give or take. A risotto will generally be done in about 20 minutes, so it is a little bit quicker. Um, you are hands-on the whole time because you are stirring it the whole time. So that is one thing to note, but it's not it's not something where you're signing up for hours of labor to, to make a dish. Um, so it's not incredibly labor-intensive. It's not super hard to make. If you're making a risotto to impress someone, which again, um, I should reiterate, risottos aren't hard to make, but for whatever reason, a lot of people find them very impressive. So this is a good thing to have in your repertoire to impress people. Uh, if you're trying to impress them and you're, you're cooking for other folks, traditional ways to, uh, to, to finish off a risotto is once everything gets down to the texture you want it, or slightly looser, like slightly more wet than you would want to serve it, uh, throw a pretty good amount of some sort of dry cheese in. So generally Parmesan or Pecorino. Um, pull it off the heat at that time. Just keep it stirring. The cheese will dissolve in. Uh, it'll emulsify with the sauce you have going. It's absolutely delicious. And then the other thing that people will typically do to finish a risotto is to toss in like a tablespoon or two of butter and stir that in. That'll emulsify in with everything else. It just makes it very, very rich and indulgent. And if you're making risotto for someone else who doesn't care about their macros, those are, you know, great ways to take it up another notch. If you're trying to make this super macro friendly, um, I promise you, if you make it without finishing it with cheese and butter, it will still be very good. It'll still be very silky and indulgent tasting while literally having the same macros as rice, which is absolutely incredible. It'll have more flavor worked into it because you're making it with stock instead of water. Um, all of the flavors from the onions, garlic, meat, whatever else you put in it will be in there. It's all mixed together. It's really, really good. Um, if you do want to finish it with a little cheese, if you have like good Parmigiano Reggiano, it doesn't take very much at all to, to kick it up another notch further. Um, without adding that many additional calories. But like I said, just a plain risotto, um, in my opinion, is is a step up from just regular rice while still having the same macros. Uh, and, you know, if you're shut in for a while and you have a lot of pantry staples, including a bunch of rice and maybe some chicken stock or beef stock or veggie stock, and you want a new recipe to play around with, 
try your hand at a risotto. Uh, it's fun, it's rewarding, it's really good. It can be very macro friendly and I would highly recommend it. Couple little swaps for you because some of us are gonna be uh, <laughs> just stopping by Flavor Town on our way to Shredsville. So a couple things you can do <laughs> is instead of using rice, pick up some riced cauliflower in the frozen aisle of the grocery. And there's quite a dilemma because you wanna get you want to get the creaminess, but you, you don't want to go with the butter. You want to get a little cheesiness mixed in, maybe a little bit of saltiness. Take out the butter. Don't put any cheese on. Go with some cottage cheese, and that's going to give you your creaminess, <laughs> a little bit of cheesiness, but you don't have to go with the butter and all the fat associated with it. So rice, cauliflower, cottage cheese, That now you're cooking. Now you're talking risotto. Honestly, that inspired me a little bit. So... I don't, I don't do, I don't do like swap style diet food. Um, cause I mean like, dude, it's, it's fucking rice. Like chicken and <laughs> rice is a bodybuilder staple. I wonder if you could make it with rice cauliflower though. So you would, you would still need some, some, some sort of starch in it to, um, to kind of like make the, the sauce come together properly. Use your like but, corn starch. What's the yeah, starch I, I, stuff? So I, I was going to say like. A little cornstarch slurry might get the job done there. Um, and then I want to go cottage cheese personally. I think just based on the texture you're going for. That's more lasagna. With a risotto. I would say like a, a ricotta, like a, a low fat ricotta um, would potentially get the job done. Or even just for, for overall creaminess, like a low fat cream cheese. Um I'm not recommending any of this. <laughs> Basically, I gave you a good thing to try. Eric gave you a shitty thing to try. If you want to make the shitty version, I think you can make the shitty version a little bit better. I, I don't know. I, I One thing I used to do, this is a real thing. Somebody told me to do it, so I just did it. I was young. I would strain my cottage cheese and just have the curds and, and like not any of the like liquid part. So strain out the curds eat the curds. Those are actually very good on their own and use the liquidy part and put it in your risotto. Nice and creamy. You, uh, you literally just gave the first step of most cheese making processes. Well, there you go. I, I'm, I'm a lot better at cooking than anyone believes. There, there's a lot of talent kind of hiding <laughs> under. Okay. Um, awesome. So I think that does it for this episode. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be back uh, at some point. We're going to do some, more sporadic uh, episodes most likely coming up but uh in any case uh take care and we will be back soon thanks for listening to the stronger by science podcast now greg and i are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter so before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional if you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it Visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.